Good evening, good evening. Today is April the 23rd, 2021, and I'm your host, Deontay Carroll, host of Turn Up the Volume Podcast, and I'm excited to be back here with you guys for another edition. Uh, I believe this is episode 17. I'm trying to keep track. Episode 17, and I'm excited because um, we're talking about a very, very, very interesting topic that's necessary to talk about when it comes to the African-American community and people in color in general. And we're talking about the uh, Derek Chauvin verdict and how that affects the African-American community. And not only are we talking about that, but we're also talking about the Makaya Bryant um, murder that took place the day that we actually received the, uh, the, the verdict, the public. And we're going to just try to unpack a lot of that today and talk about how that affects us and where do we go moving forward. Um, in, the, in the African-American community. Um, and so I got what I call, I talked to them before I brought them on, but I have what I call the, the, the brotherhood or the, 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 the brotherhood panel, the manhood panel, uh, Brother James Brooks. I got Brother James Brooks. How you doing, James? Hey, brother. Good to be back. Good, good. I got, not only do I got James Brooks here, but I got my fellow seminarian here, one only, uh, the one and only Trey Daniels. How you doing, Trey? Just excited to be here to talk about, you know, the awesome decision um, and hopefully what we can do as a people to move forward. Absolutely, absolutely. So, brothers, uh, before we get started, I know a lot of people have seen it, but I just want to play it because I don't know. It just did something for me when I saw when I see the verdict. Every time I see the verdict. You know, every time I see uh, them talk about or, 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 or the judge read the verdict to uh, Derek Chauvin, just the look on his face, you know, and, and I just, it's, it's, it's so rare. It's sad to say that, but it's so rare to see that in the African-American community that some will argue that it really wasn't justice, but it was accountability. Uh, but just to see it happen, it was just so mind, mm. mind-boggling, you know, and, and just like, wow, for once we didn't have to go and get an appeal or try a case again. But the first time that something was brought like that was brought to the court, you know, the right decision was rendered. So I'm, I'm going to try to play this. Uh, so make sure that before we, let's see. Members of the jury, I will now read the verdicts as they will appear in the permanent records of the 4th Judicial District. State of Minnesota, County of Hennepin, District Court, 4th Judicial District, State of Minnesota Plaintiff versus Derek Michael Chauvin, Defendant. Verdict, Count 1, Court File Number 27, CR 20-12646. We, the jury, in the above entitled matter as to Count 1, unintentional second-degree murder while committing a felony, find the defendant guilty. This verdict agreed to this 20th day of April, 2021, at 1.44 p.m. Signed, Juror Four Person, Juror Number 19. Hmm. Same caption, verdict count two. We, the jury, in the above entitled matter as to count two, third degree murder, perpetrating an eminently dangerous act, find the defendant guilty. This verdict agreed to this 20th day of April, 2021, at 1.45 p.m. Signed by jury four person, juror number 19. Same caption, verdict count three. We, the jury, in the above entitled matter as to count three, Second degree manslaughter, culpable negligence, creating an unreasonable risk. Find the defendant guilty. This verdict agreed to this 20th day of April 2021 at 1.45 p.m. Jury four person 019. Members of the jury, I'm now going to ask you individually if these are your true and correct verdicts. Please respond yes or no. Juror number two, are these your true and correct verdicts? Yes. Juror number nine, are these your true and correct verdicts? Yes. Juror number 19, are these your true and correct verdicts? Yes. Juror number 27, are these your true and correct verdicts? Yes. Juror number 44, are these your true and correct verdicts? Yes. Juror number 52, are these your true and correct verdicts? Yes. Juror number 55, are these your true and correct verdicts? Yes. Juror number 79, are these your true and correct verdicts? Yes. Juror number 85, are these your true and correct verdicts? Yes. Juror number 89, is this your, are these your true and correct verdicts? Yes. Juror number 91, are these your true and correct verdicts? Yes. Juror number 92, are these your true and correct verdicts? Yes. 
Are these your verdicts? So say you one, so say you all. Yes. 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 Members of the jury, I find that uh, the verdicts as read reflect the will of the jury and will be filed accordingly. I have to thank you on behalf of the people of the state of Minnesota for not only jury service, but heavy duty jury service. What I'm going to ask you to do now is to follow the deputy back into your usual room and I will join you in a few minutes to answer questions and to advise you further. So all rise for the jury. Seated. With the guilty verdicts returned, we're going to have uh, Blakely, you may file a uh, written argument as to Blakely factors within one week. The court will issue findings on the Blakely factors, the factual findings, one week after that. We'll order a PSI immediately returnable in four weeks. And we will also have a briefing on, after you get the PSI, six weeks from now and then eight weeks from now we will have sentencing we'll get you the exact dates uh in a scheduling order is there a motion on behalf of the state uh, we move to have the court uh, revoke the defendant's bail and remand him into custody uh, pending sentencing bail is revoked bond is discharged and the defendant is remanded to the custody of the hennepin county sheriff anything further oh, all right thank you We're adjourned. I just love that right there. We're adjourned. <laughs> the door slams. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> we come back eight weeks for sentencing. Y'all, listen. Listen, help me unpack this, okay? Because I don't know about y'all, James and, and Trey, but when I heard that verdict, I felt a sigh of relief. Like, I just felt this... <sighs> I can breathe. Not necessarily I can breathe because of the fact that there was going to be nobody upset. Nobody's, you know, going to be protesting or what have you. But the fact that for once, for once we saw a man being tried for something that we all saw that was unethical, immoral, unjust, and we got a verdict that matches what we saw on TV. I just want, so I'm, James, I'm going to start with you. So what did, what, did you expect that verdict uh, was... Was that something you were expecting? Were you surprised? Like, what was your response to that? Uh, brother, well, first of all, brothers, it's so glad to be back. Uh, man, I, regarding the verdict, I was on the heels <laughs> of my shoes wondering if this was going to actually occur. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I was I was anxiously optimistic but I was prepared. Okay. Right? I was prepared. I didn't think that it was going to, you know, I didn't think he was going to get convicted on three counts, but the funny part is is that, you know, folk understood that, you know, the jurors were seeing the same thing that we were seeing, which is why they convicted this guy on all three counts. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's a it's funny, you know, I'm reminded that all your options come with a cost, and so he was just living out, out his option. But the jury, uh, people of color, uh, people that believe in justice, uh, to see that, you know, finally, you know, this case went down like it was supposed to. And, right. and that's what I was excited about. Uh, every, you know, everybody's hurting this, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, finally, you know, justice did, you know, uh, the mother of justice, she did have it where her weight was leaning toward the right thing instead of what, what, what they wanted it to be. Mm -hmm. Trey, what about you, brother? Yeah, it was a it was really a combination um, of everything 
uh, once I once hearing the verdict, I was actually driving home from, you know, a long day of work. I think the verdict came out sometime around 530 Eastern time. I'm driving home from a long day of work, seeing the people's face on the highway, um, driving through Atlanta, um, hearing people even um, broadcasting the verdict over their um, car stereos. Mm. I really put some jubilation and some joy inside of me. Um, you know, not not the simple fact, of course, not not to be inhumane or, or anything. Of course, I understand, you know, someone is being locked up, accosted. Um, but at the same time, to understand that someone's life was taken, right? And to mm-hmm. understand that um, some of these young men and young women, I would say even my generation, I don't think we really ever seen, you know, this this liberty and justice for all right. um, kind of mantra play out in court system. You know, we I I, I think back to Trayvon Martin. Um, that I think that's why when I really first to get involved, first got involved. You know, um, scrutinizing our justice system. And that was due to the trial of Trayvon Martin. Yeah. Um, and to not see George Zimmerman, you know, <laughs> come down with anything. Uh, not even really a slap on the wrist kind of, you know, made no me question and made me not really even take our justice system. It, 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 exactly, exactly. Yeah. So for me, it, w- it was really just a combination of years and years and years of, you know, hoping and wishing um, and to see this actually come full circle and see this actually happen um, really made me. And I know we're going to talk about it, but it really made me think about where do we go from here? So mm-hmm. this is an excellent title, brother. Thank you. Yeah, you know, for me, it was so. So the crazy thing was, because um, Trey, as a matter of fact, James and Trey, I was that particular day. I remember hitting both of y'all up and like y'all watching, you know, like y'all, yeah, because I'm finna, I'm, I'm finna do something on Friday. If we get a verdict by Friday, I'm gonna do something on Friday. And uh, I remember just communicating with the both of y'all back and forth, man. And just and just really <laughs> kind of seeing y'all, yeah, Jane. Look, you know, and, and I was really getting y'all vibe on it, you know. And uh, <laughs> I remember because, yeah. like me and James, we love the news. He watched MSNBC, seeing he watched everything. You know, I'm the same way. And so I was upstairs. I had my infant, mm-hmm. and so I, my wife and my and my son was they was downstairs, you know, chilling. I had took my my baby upstairs. And I'm like, oh, I'm gonna wash clothes until something happened. And so I go upstairs. I didn't even get a chance to put not near a piece of clothing in the washing machine. And my phone went off. Well, I had cut <laughs> CNN on. Listen, I had, yeah. mind you, my daughter, she's only two months old, right? And so, you know, she's at that stage to where, you know, you think about babies dying in cribs and all kind of stuff and accidents happening and all that. And so I'm upstairs and um, I start screaming. I said, bang, bang. And she and she just paused like she couldn't even respond. As so I took my daughter, ran downstairs. She thought something happened to the baby. I said, "Baby, got a verdict." I said, "I don't care what you're doing, what you're watching. You got to cut the news on because we got to see this." And so, listen, my mother-in-law had came by and everything, and you know she was dropping something off. I, I was stuck on the couch. I couldn't move because, as a black man, I felt something. I felt like mm-hmm. this might be another Trayvon Martin. You know, situation to where, like how George Zimmerman got off, this cop might get off. You know, and so and I felt mm-hmm. anxiety. Mm-hmm. I felt, you know, just I had so many mixed emotions because I'm like, as a black man, that could have been me. You know what I'm saying? Like that could have been me with a knee on my neck and a, a white man getting off. You follow what I'm saying? Because there was no mm-hmm. regard for my life, and so. My wife actually, she had recorded my reaction, and I wasn't really paying any attention. But I was just at a loss for words. Like when they said count one guilty, count two guilty, count three guilty, and I was like, "Are you serious? Like, no, is this this not no prank? This not no like this jury actually found mm-hmm. this man guilty, and it's sad that we have to say that as people of color that you know we're surprised or we're shocked or." We had lack of faith in right. the judicial system that, you know, justice was going to be served or what have you in this particular situation. And, man, just to see them just put him in handcuffs and walk him off and to see that door slam, like, it was just a sigh of relief, you know. But the thing that I really want to talk about is, okay, so we got a verdict, That's but where real. do we go from here? Because there's it's still work that needs to be done. Mm-hmm. 
And and the proof of what I'm talking Absolutely. about, there's still, there's still work to be done, is right before we got the verdict, Micaiah Bryant happened. Her murder happened. And so that's just one verdict compared to the work that we have to do and that we all have to put in collectively to see some change. Because the bottom line about it is, even though we had this particular jury in this case, we might not have that same jury in the Micaiah Bryant case. We might not have that same kind of jury in the Dante Right case, you know, when when their uh, murderers go up for you know their particular respective trials. So, I, so I just want to ask the question. I'm a, I'm a toss it. I'm gonna mm-hmm. toss it, James, at you. I'm a, you can lay it up, slam dunk it, however you want. So, in your opinion, you know, because you, you, my political analyst, you know, where do we go from here? Like, how do we how do we move forward? Okay, we got a verdict. You know, some of us celebrate it, but where do we go from here with this verdict? Right. So thanks, brother. I think that uh, one of the things that we have to understand as a community or as people uh, that believe in justice is that when we went through actions rather than argument, <clears throat> no one's offended. And you, right. you, 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 your point is proven. What, what, what am I saying? When when we marched for Black Lives Matter because of what happened to Brother George Floyd, that was one part of it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I believe that all of the naysayers and all of the evildoers were looking for us to uh, potentially tear up another city mm-hmm. or, or tear down another um, but that, that didn't happen so I think where we go, and that's this, if we know that the police force is that entity that uh, is abusing the community, then what we may need to do is, brothers, we may have to address that where very good brothers and sisters uh, calling on the, the Asian brothers and sisters, the, the, the white Caucasian brothers and sisters, uh, the freedom fighters, and of course our black and brown brothers and sisters to look into going into law law enforcement. Mm-hmm. So when I roll up on the scene and I see that you got your neck on, on, on something that it's not supposed to be that way or your camera's not on, then I'd have a like-minded brother or sister that just taps someone on the shoulder and say, hey, 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 okay, look, let's do something different. We can't go down this road. What happened was he was surrounded around nobody but rookies. Mm. And clearly no one had the breath or the sense to say, hey, look, man, you're doing a little bit too much with that. Mm -hmm. Look, the call-ins that he called later that came on the scene, the the damage was already done. And I'm sure maybe within that group, it might have been some people like, hey, look, man, we don't want to go down like this. So this is a moment Mm -hmm. also to encourage young brothers and sisters to consider going into or looking into law enforcement to bring a new or different type of eye to the situation. Mm-hmm. Everybody doesn't need to be pulled over if I'm in the squad car with my boy, that's a that's a clear brother, Caucasian brother, or, 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 or someone else. Like, look, let's just see and approach this with some common sense. We don't need to draw no guns. You got my, you got my six, I got yours. So let's go and see what's going on and take it from there. But it's not enough for us to sit on the margins of what's going on and be the armchair revolutionaries where we sit back in our chairs in the barbershops or, or we talk to our friends over social media about what we should be doing and no one is actually doing something. So I encourage all of the young brothers and sisters to possibly look into law enforcement as a way to not only be there when we need them, but to protect the community in situations like this to diminish any capacity of something like this ever happening again. Yeah, and you know, uh, so James, you and I work together yes. outside of. If, if I could, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, Trent, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. If if I could, um, because um, James, you're making an excellent point of, uh, you know, there, there's really two tactics in which you know we can move forward, and I love how you're setting up the first one, which is really infiltrating the system, changing the system from the inside out. Whereas though, I'm I'm thinking, you know. 
police reform. Let, let's change that. You know, I'm coming at you with another tactic, but really, it's really, I think it's those two tactics. I'm thinking about police reform, changing the system from the outside in. I think we really need to um, reform um, some of these police um, 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 police places. I mean, that's the police places. Some of these uh, states, um, some of these um, police sanctions, all, all of these things, even looking at gun gun laws, right? I think all of these things need to come into um, into really a scrutinized or criticized um, look to see where can we change, where what needs to be operated different as it relates to um, the way law enforcement who have been vowed to protect and serve. How can we really change um, the way in which they protect and serve? Because from what I hear, a lot of the law enforcement don't necessarily live in the particular community in right. which they oversee or the beat that they have. And I think right. that's a that that in itself, right, need, needs to even be looked at and scrutinized. Um, but I want to commend uh, Reverend Dante as well, because the last time we was on here, we were looking at voter rights. Mm. Now, today that we're on here, you know, we're looking at and I'm calling out police reform, which yeah. for me are like the two most critical modern day civil rights um, things that I think we as people uh, need to look at. Right. Right. So I so I really want to commend you both on that. But but yeah, I, I think police reform is definitely next up. I think we can't wait. I think it needs to be um, across the nation, not just in, yeah, not just in specific cities, but you know, I, I understand that they're probing into uh, Minnesota's police department, but yeah. I think it needs to be a, a probing into all. Yeah, yeah. And so, so, so the the point that I was getting ready to make. So before you started talking, Trey, so James, you and I work together outside of you know the podcast, and you know, and when I asked you to come on the podcast full circle, you and I realized that we work together. Outside of this, you work for DCPS, the DC public school system, and I work on the law enforcement side of dealing with juveniles. And so all day long, my job is to deal with juveniles who break the law, right? Who find themselves in situations to where they on probation, you know, different kinds of agreements and, and things of that nature. And one thing I can say about the system in DC that I work for is it's gotten to the place to where it's less punitive and more so restorative. And so what I mean by that is they've taken the power from, you know, uh, probation officers in D.C. to just lock youth up for any little thing, but to find ways to really engage with the youth, to find ways to figure out what are some of these issues that really drive them to do some of the things that they do, or you know, or what have you. And so, it, it, in its own way, it's been reformed on that. You know, but that's just one, you know, particular uh, uh, branch and one particular, you know, entity in this whole nation because I forgot who it was that I was listening to, but it's good that Minnesota is being looked at and they're there under the microscope, but we need something federally now that's going to change the whole nation because uh, if, if, if not, then we're going to be in different states each and every month fighting the same fight and going after people in the same particular way, whereas we need to do something on a bigger, massive scale. Right. And, and, and that's in my humble opinion, I feel like that's what we need to be doing is to is to not just focus on the states or the local. But we really need to make some federal kind of legislation or mandates to where, you know, legislation is being changed to where there's reform on, on, on you know, in every state. Say this, too. So. Uh -huh. I think that one of the things that, that, that we have to understand as brothers and sisters is this. We have to understand that this verdict where police officers came against their own and knocked down the blue wall is very rare. Yeah. Right. Let's talk. Let's talk about that. Yeah. So so that's very rare. So you have Minneapolis police officers that came to testify against their own. That's that's very rare. OK. Yeah. But. Mm -hmm. But what we have to do with that is, since we see that, we have to be careful. We have to understand that because this occurred, then what's going to happen, just like with subtle racism, mm -hmm. they're going to get more smarter and more deliberate, but deliberate in the sense of they're going to be more secretive 
in terms right. of how they actually do it now. Right. So we're going to have to understand that as people of color that live here. Mm -hmm. They're not going to make sure they're not going to. It's not going to be a thing where you're going to see another knee on the neck. Right. It may come in a totally different form. Right. So be, be on the lookout for that. And, and that's why I say further that we have to be come, come in contact with police office, officers to not to make the situation worse. What do I mean by that? Watch this. Mm -hmm. If I know, and this is, a, this is a form of what we have to do. It hurts in the community, but we got to be like this, though especially the time that we live in it yeah. we got to be accountable for certain things that we do so look if i'm riding in the in the car with buddy and i got my main man hank in the back and i know they dirty or i know they got something on them then i shouldn't the first thing i got to do is think like wait a minute if i find myself or catch myself caught up then the situation may be worse and it may not be a george floyd camera there right. now watch this i want y'all to remember this George Floyd made one of the worst decisions that caused him his life. And you uh, know what that is? What's that? That's hanging around the wrong people in the community. Mm -hmm. Watch this. If you watch the video yeah. from what the prosecution showed us, there was a brother, the same brother that wanted to say, look, I plead the fifth. I don't want to be charged with nothing, so I don't right. want to be a part of this. Right. But I know what y'all talking about. Right. There was a brother that came up in there and gave uh brother floyd some dap right if you caught that right when I he gave that. him the Go dap ahead. i wonder i wonder if that was the 20 dollar bill that he put in his hand mm. right i want y'all to go mm. back and check that out the brother came inside mm. of mm. the the corner store okay and i gotta go back he and gave that. brother mm -hmm. he gave brother george some dap and when he gave him some dap for all those that are familiar with the street talk. Sometimes yeah. you give somebody some dap because you won't give them some. Look, I, we got grandparents right. that do so it. They, they slide us money when they give us fives and stuff. That's you know, there you go. The, <laughs> see, there you go. <laughs> right, right. And this is this go. is part of the African American. This is what we do. It's not just you know drug transactions, but like I've had That's uncles right. and, and relatives that let me. Hey, what's up? Give me give me five. That's you right. know, and, and while they give me a five, they slip That's it something right. in my hand so nobody can see it. So, but That's yeah, right. but yeah, go ahead, That's go ahead. Right. I'm listening. So yeah. I say that to say that we have to be responsible in the community by not putting ourselves in position to allow police officers to take out whatever they feel inside of them on us. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. I'm asking and pleading with the brothers and sisters. The Asian brothers and sisters, all of us, man, to check that at the door, depending on who you get in the car with and what they doing. Because right. if they if they ain't good for you, then chances are they ain't going to be good for a situation that you may find yourself in either. Right. So I wanted to put that out there because, like I said before, be, be, be careful now. This verdict was happy and good for some people, but not for all. So now, therefore, I mm -hmm. believe what's going to happen is, and we have to be critically conscious of this, we're going to have to be even more conscious in terms of how we interact and uh, 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 allow the police officers to roll up on us to find out whether it's more than a license and registration, please. Right. Now, now, so, 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 Jane, now before, Trey, before you go, because I'm, I'm going to let you, I know you probably got something you want to say. So, so what you're talking about, James, is two ends of the spectrum mm -hmm. here that we have to look at. And reflective listening based upon what you're saying is not only should we be mindful of having our interactions with law enforcement for whatever reasons they may try to pull up as to why they're pulling us over or having interactions with us but don't give them no ammo right don't give them a reason to try to when something goes down discredit exactly. us because what, what ended up happening was or what the defense did was during the Derek chauvin trial he tried to make it less about the those nine minutes or 29 seconds and more about what led up to that police interaction in terms of his drug habits and, and, and things of that nature or his company that he kept. And he tried to make it less about the fact that regardless of how he got there, George Floyd, that, granted, if he if, if he was going to have the interaction with law enforcement, cool and fine. Because we all, somewhere down the line in our, in our lives, have interactions in law enforcement, whether it's on a big scale or a small scale. But... Something like that, you're not supposed to lose your life because you got the officer's knee on your neck. 
And then when it's time yeah. to go to trial, Absolutely. the only thing the defense want to talk about is, well, Absolutely. it's not the knee, but it's the drugs he had in the system. And we want to bring, you know, his buddy in the car because, you know, we know without saying that he, if we put him on the stand, he going to tell who gave him drugs or who this, you know, and that's going to be a whole nother thing. And so, and I think that speaks volumes to what you're saying. Now, the, the, here's the thing. I see people who talk about that in front of white supremacy, but see, it's platforms like this where we get to have these conversations amongst ourselves to say, but for future reference, right, you need to be mindful when you're out there about your, about the company you keep, about who you're entertaining, because you don't want to find yourself in a situation to where you're giving white supremacy an ammo, because guess what? White supremacy wears a badge now, right? And so, and, 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 I, and I tell kids on my caseload, James, because you know the kids, we deal with some of the same youth. You deal with them on the educational side, I deal with them on the law enforcement side. I tell kids on my caseload all the time, I say, hey, listen, I tell them, look, you might have gotten in trouble for one little thing, but when you come my way, we got to pay attention to your drug usage. We got to pay attention to, you know, who's in the house. We got to pay attention to all this other kind of stuff because now we have to give a report to the judge now. So so when you came in for something so small and now they're trying to wonder and figure out, well, why, why are they asking about my curfew? Why are they asking about this? Why are they asking? Because by you, by you getting in trouble, all of that now is being monitored and now we got to look for everything. And so I think the same thing applies that, hey, this is a time, this is a platform to where we talk to our people whoever's watching this podcast like hey listen we get it there's two ends of the spectrum you find yourself in trouble with law enforcement or you find yourself with interactions and then now they try to start looking for stuff don't give them no ammo trey go ahead absolutely i, I definitely agree I, I think to your point you're speaking about accountability right uh, right the, that's what it sounds like the about. action in which you know we, yeah we, we're holding one another accountable right um because it's not just uh, George Floyd, right. but if you look closer, if you look deeper, like you said, Dante, like, like that could have been you, that could have been me, you know, that could have been Jane, that could have been any of us, any black male for, for, for that instance. Mm -hmm. I think we do need to speak truth to power to one another um, and say, man, you know, come on, bro. Like, like, like you know, you know, you got warrants out you know, but you're going to put me in a position where I really have no choice, you know, but to comply. I, I, you know, they're pulling both of us over. Like, I, I, you're in my car. Like, you know, yeah. so I think it, it really comes down to accountability. But I heard a startling um, statistic, and I, and I want um, the audience and, and I want your followers to really to fact check me on this um, or really just look deeper into it. But I think I heard an interview yesterday and Stacey Abrams said a startling statistic saying that since the uh, Chauvin trial had started to the day it ended, mm -hmm. somebody has died in police custody. Mm. So that, uh, you know, um, that just begs to the point that they are doing um, they are doing it in such maniacal, such unique, such different ways of really trying to snuff us out. Um, it, it, we, we, we just talked about it. Micaiah Bryant, um, Dante Wright, you know, all of these, all of these people. And of course, you know, there's so many others who names we may have not even gotten across our, our phones, names that, you know, aren't written about in the newspaper, uh, names who, who may not have been tweeted out there. But we have to also, you know, just be mindful of what's going on. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and I hate to, to really make it spiritual, but we're dealing with um, spiritual wickedness in high places like cool. talk about it. the systems, honestly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like like like, like the system, honestly, just taking a look at the system. So we have to be mindful about that. the way we move, how we move, um, not only within our own community, but of course, when we get out to the world and when we're shaking and we're moving. Maybe in a neighborhood, you know, that don't don't have a lot of uh, residents that look like us or, mm -hmm. or maybe in the school system or the or the universities, you know. So I think that was an excellent point that you made, James. You know, I, it's it's so interesting. Every time. We and if find... I say so. Go so, ahead, James. Go ahead. One... go ahead, brother. I'm sorry. Go ahead, James. Go ahead. I'll let you go. ahead. No, I was just going to say, brother, the, the, the real real quick, the conversation that we normally have with the young brothers or even our young kids that we have, and as common as that we have that conversation of how to act when the police pull us over. Mm -hmm. But I think 
and I'm going to lean on you on this one right here, uh, 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 D, is this. The second part of that conversation has to be not putting ourselves in positions with people that may be around us to contribute to the police officers wanting to bang us in our heads. Right. That's the second part of that conversation. Right. That it's 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 that it's that level of accountability. Like who who are you calling your man's? Like who, who who's your hanging partners? Who are you running with? Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Because like right. I said, you don't want to give the police ammo. Because guess what? You could be have the cleanest record amongst the bunch, but you might not know that your buddies and your homeboys, they've had several incidents with law enforcement. And what happens after those mm -hmm. several instances or those several run-ins? After those several run-ins, they got their picture. They know their names. They know where they hang out at. And so when they go down, everybody that's attached to them is going down, right? And so and so the and, and what I was leading up to is the part that really grinds my gears, as my dad would say, is when our people <laughs> find themselves victims to police brutality and die unrighteously and die unnecessarily. It's always the fact that they all will, always want to bring up their character of the victim, of the person. They can't even defend themselves. They want to bring up their past right. run-ins. They want to bring up stuff that they done did, if you follow what I'm saying. But but right. but what they did in, in the situation that led to their death does not match that particular punishment that they got. Right, so I don't care how much drug mm -hmm. usage. Now, granted, I'm not one to consume drugs. I'm not condoning the usage of drugs we have because I know, you know, drugs and, and people lace up with drugs and it and it does wonders to your body, right, in a negative way. But at the end of the day, I don't care how much drugs a person takes. That doesn't that doesn't mean that they should die because you know they're taking drugs, right? That doesn't mean you're supposed Absolutely. to kill them or, or or put a bullet inside of them because and see and see this is the fact. This is the point to where. When they're talking about defunding the police, they, they, what that really means is you bring mental health professionals to ride along with the police so that when you get calls as a police officer about individuals who are mentally disturbed or, or, or under mental distress, right? you have people who can help de-escalate them. Because the reality is if we look at the police officers, they are trained to shoot to kill. You know, They're not trained to shoot at the leg. You know, and We're going to talk about that when we get to Makai Bryant. But you know, they're trained... Mm -hmm. For center mass, right? And so the unfortunate part we're gonna get into it is, you know, when it comes to that, when it comes to people of color, the 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 mindset is to shoot to kill and to go from a zero to a thousand quickly, right? So, but that's that's the problem we got to talk about. But but the point that I'm making is, listen, we have to be very 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 mindful of the company we keep. We have to be mindful of. of of a lot of things because guess what we can get pulled over for the slightest thing but it can turn bad very quickly for people of color perfect example look at the army lieutenant down in virginia right who got pulled over they didn't even stop yeah. they didn't even tell him what he was getting pulled over for they just drew their guns and told him to step out the car he's trying to understand ask a basic question why are you pulling me over? And and immediately they go from zero to a thousand immediately. Army fatigue, uniform, and all. So it's like, you know what I'm saying? Like, Hands up. I, I'm just trying to understand. I, I'm just trying to understand. And, 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 you know, I don't really like, you know, talking about my personal business or what have you. But like I said, I work with juveniles. I carry a badge and, and all that stuff, you know, on the law enforcement side. But at the end of the day, when I if I get pulled over, that ain't going to matter. Because if, if this brother with a with an army uniform get pulled over and get pepper sprayed, what that gonna say about me who don't wear a person that doesn't wear a uniform? You follow what I'm saying? So so the plight of my people is something is something that I take very serious, and these are the conversations we gotta have. You know, it, 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 it's just it, I I was reading so, I forgot who it was I quoted, but uh, so I heard somebody say. One of the one of the main things that a black father fears in in twenty twenty one is he or his son could be George Floyd, and so th that f me as a as a father of three black boys, and then now I got a daughter on top of that. So it's like when I look at Trayvon Martin, I'm thinking about all three of my boys. When I think about Breonna Taylor, I think about uh, Micaiah Bryant. I'm thinking about my daughter who has to grow up in this in this world. So it's like I have so much that's, that's just pulling as a black man who's raising 
two different genders in one house. You know what I'm saying? And so the, these are the struggles that we as black fathers go through. You know, even if you're not a father, just trying to be black and a man in America, that is just, it, it's, it's, it can be a lot. It can be a lot. Brother, if I might add to that, man, I think that uh, I was reflecting on what you were saying, mm -hmm. Brother Deontay, and, 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 and so I'm reminded of that when we are born, we look like our mother and father, mm -hmm. but when we die, we look like our decisions. So this is the time Ooh. for black Ooh. folk to make really good decisions in terms of what they're going to do, Ooh. right? And that's real. So, you know, we got to... We gotta, Keep up, like like my grandmama would say, we gotta hold that blood stained banner until we yes, die. Sir. Yeah, hmm. and understand that you know this is also a way to for brothers and sisters to get into organizations or uh, uh, those particular movements mm -hmm. where they can be a part of and bring the change that we want to see. And yeah. so, hopefully, you know, for example brothers and sisters that may hear this from down in South Carolina can touch base with brother Tim Scott to be like, hey, look, why don't you hurry up and negotiate from the Republican side as a brother the George Floyd Act that they're trying to pass in Congress mm -hmm. on police brutality, okay? Right. Don't hold it up. Don't drag your feet, you know, because you could get pulled over with, on, on those town streets or on those... Uh, Absolutely. highways and byways in South right. Carolina too. Right. It's not that many people that know you in Congress, mm -hmm. but the ones that do know that protect you may not be the one that can protect you when you get pulled over also. So brother Tim Scott needs to go ahead and assist uh, with making that reality real uh, on the Senate since it's been passed in the House and make that reality. And see, this is the thing when we're talking about uh, what you say, what you said just now, James. This is what you call holding your elected officials accountable, right? Mm -hmm. This is what you call, hey, we've given you the vote, whether Republican, Democrat. Now it's your responsibility to go in there and do what needs to be done. Because and, and, and see, here's the the flip side to it. You have a lot of politicians in Congress in elected places to where they make decisions based upon their own personal gain, not necessarily on the well-being of the people that they serve. Because we forget when you're an elected official, you serve the people that you represent. You serve right. the collective voices in, in, in the majority of those who are asking for certain things. And so... After you get the vote, okay, the next thing is you're going to hear our mouth. You're going to see us knocking at your door. You're going to see us coming mm -hmm. to Congress. You're going to see us coming to the, 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 down to the courthouses and into the, into the, the um, legislative buildings or what have you, the Canaan building down here in D.C. You follow what I'm saying? Where, where y'all offices mm -hmm. are, what have you. You're going to hear from us. You know? and, and if you don't like hearing from us, then be prepared to lose your next election. Be prepared to hear from us again at the ballot because if you're not going to do what it needs, what needs to be done to make sure <laughs> that what we're asking for is granted, this then that means you don't need this job no more. That means somebody else need to occupy that seat. Trey, go ahead. Absolutely, yeah, and that's just moving right into the you know the voter rights mm -hmm. and how you know we talked about it. <laughs> like, it's all connected. It's all connected. How, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely, absolutely. Because yeah, we we just really need to hold them accountable. Um, and and what he has not done as it relates to the police reform, as you know, as it even relates to the Second Amendment for all these gun laws, and how some of these states, i.e., Texas, yeah. are even looking to have people carry guns without even you know having a permit. Right. So. You know, it just, it just speaks to how deep and how valuable the vote is. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, we, we get up when it's celebrity, we get up when it's presidency, but just as important as the presidential election is, 
is your state election, electing your state officials, election, you know, electing that that, that tax commissioner, electing um, your senator, all of these different play, people who play key and pivotal points as into um, institu institutionalizing change. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, like I said, the, these are the main two um, things that we're looking at at, the, at this modern civil rights moment that we're in right now in 2021. Now, we're talking about the Derek Chauvin verdict. We, we've already talked about, you know, where do we go from here? We talked about the main thing is legislation needs to be changed and we need to come together to be able to mobilize and to organize. And to now that we have this verdict, I believe, and I, and y'all can y'all can tell me what you think about this, but I believe that now that we have this verdict, there has been a precedence set now to where mm. this particular verdict has the door cracked open for us to bombard and go through the door and get legislation changed. And so while we have this verdict, yes, a lot of us celebrated. We were, you know, ecstatic, what have you, but we got our foot in the door and we're able we we were able to get the door cracked open. Now we need to go in and change legislation and do things to where we can get things changed on a massive, you know, level. Now, here's the thing. So one charge that he was found guilty of, he was charged to where he can get up to 40 years. The second one, um, he was he would get up to 20 years. And then the one which I think is manslaughter, you get like 10 years or something like that. I'm a firm believer based upon, you know, how things kind of run in the court. He's not going to do 40 years. He's it's anywhere between what is it like 12 and 20 or 25 or something to a degree. Um, so mm -hmm. so I, and I want to ask y'all this because we need to be prepared for this because a lot of people think he's going to get 40 years or what have you. You follow what I'm saying? And so that's true. If he doesn't get 40 years, I don't want our people to be disappointed. Right. So. Um, J James and Trey, give me. What, what do you believe the judge is gonna give him? Because because he didn't. He put his fate in the judge's hands rather than in the jury's hands. So what do, what do you think the judge is gonna give him based upon how the judge has been flowing this whole particular trial? James, I'm gonna start with you. Right. You so so you. Yeah, brother. So so you notice that you notice that. Yes. Uh, uh, that's interesting that you notice that you picked that up. Mm -hmm. The thing is, because this is his first offense, mm -hmm. yep. then there could be a little leniency, as you were bringing up, D, on that topic. However, when we look at Minnesota law, they have this thing called aggravated um, measures that they can, that the judge can consider to increase the time. And I hope that that's something that the prosecution and I think I think they're on it that. You know, Brother Ellis has been on top of it, so oh, I'll hats off to him on that. He put yes. together and assembled a very diverse and uh, very uh, effective legal team. But mm -hmm. so what happens is one of the things that I learned was that aggravation can be where he did this in front of a child, mm -hmm. right? So those are aggravated circumstances that the prosecution, the government can argue on top of the sentencing that he may get to add more to it. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that that's the direction they're moving in, whether the, it's at the judge's discretion, of course. So we're, 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 I'm gonna go back to something. I also looked at the judge's face too. Mm -hmm. And the judge looked to me, and I could be wrong, where <laughs> if I do have to determine how long you are gonna be up in this, by mm -hmm. looking at his face, he felt embarrassed as mm. a person that represented that community mm. yeah so you know what that will mean who knows but i do believe that the aggravated piece of it may add something but again you wrestling with this is the guy's first offense on something like this so i'm with you i wouldn't hold my breath on that he, yeah. he may not get the 40. he'll get something you know but he may not get the 40. i don't think he will trey what you think yeah, to, to that point, um, and I think that's the the major stake in the in the case, right? Is is the simple fact that it's his first um, offense, so the upward number of time he he definitely won't serve that. Of course, not only that, probation, all all, all of these other um, things that we have to take into account. But I mean, I, I really want to 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 not even focus on the time, but to focus on the simple fact, like you said, I think this is a precedence. Mm -hmm. um, because we have some 
quite a few other cases that's coming up or um, should be coming up later on in this year. Thinking about the Ahmaud Aubrey, right? Mm -hmm. um, case and understanding while they're not law enforcement, it still sets this precedent of, you know, the slain black body. Like, right. like, like, what is the value of the slain black body? Are, are we letting people go, you know, or are we simply saying, hey, you will have to serve some time. I also think about the um, the cop who killed, I think it was the Dallas, the Dallas young man. His name is Miss Slipping Me right now. Mm -hmm. But he, even her, her, right, being arrested and, and, and going through different trials and different things of that nature. So I think a precedence is set. Mm -hmm. Now, I think we as a community, we have to rally around the fact that, you know, they, they may not get as much time as someone who's selling crack cocaine, you know, who, who, who's serving quite some time in there. They might not right. get that amount of time. But, you know, uh, it is a start. It is a start. And once we start moving to legislation and start actually changing some laws, um, then, of course, we can really say that justice has been served. I want to shift gears a little bit. Um Makaya Bryant. Now, for those of us mm. that have been watching the news and been following Makaya Bryant, I believe she was 16, 15. The, the, her age, people bouncing back and forth about her age. Uh, about 16 mm. years old, who lost her life. Um, it was reported that she was in foster care or what have you. Um, she had other females who were coming to, you know, jump her, attack her. Right. And it is reported that she called police by the time this particular police officer showed up to our knowledge from from what we could see in the video footage. There were already two police officers who were present by the time the third police officer shows up. You know, she has a knife. She's she's swinging and she's, you know, fighting. She's in she's in a whole fight with these individuals now. I'm going to play this, you know, and I say we got to play this, but hey, it is what it is. I'm just giving you a warning, five seconds, if you want to turn your head, if you want to, you know, or what have you. And hey, that's fine. But um, but but see, so and, and, I, and I'm playing this because there's something else I want to play. Um, So, James and Trey, when we look at the Makaya Bryant uh, murder... What I found out over the last couple of days is the African-American community is split on this particular situation because some people are mm -hmm. saying, well, the officer had a split decision. Within 22 seconds, she's swinging, she hitting, and she was cocking a knife back, get ready to stab somebody. So you have some people in the African-American community that are saying, you know, it was justified while it may be excessive. Then you have other people in the African-American community who are on the other side of the spectrum. They're saying bump that she was 15, 16. She wasn't supposed to die. I don't care how messy it was. Now, I'm going to play this video and I'm going to play something else that's, that's going to kind of tie this up. So I'm going to play this first. I'm going to play this first. Mm-hmm. Hey, what's going on? Hey, what's going on? Hey, 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 get down, get down, get down, get down. Hey, no, you ain't shoot my fucking baby. You shot my baby. I didn't do anything. I swear to God, you killed me. It's hard to watch that video, but when I look at that video, mm -hmm. here's the thing, and, and, and this is the thing, right? Now, granted, officers are trained to shoot to kill, because I've heard some people say, why well, he didn't shoot in the leg. They're trained to shoot to kill. They're trained in situations like that to go to either meet their, their level of force to meet it or go a step higher. Like, that's just how they're trained. Right. But here's the problem, though, with this. The problem with this is um, when it comes to white folks. Police officers tend to um, de-escalate. They tend to go ahead and wrestle and fight with white folks. But when it comes to people of color in the same situations, 
it's not even across the board. It's always to go from zero to a thousand immediately. It's always, it's like there's this systemic rule when it comes to dealing with people of color that, hey, when it comes to people of color, we don't try to de-escalate. We try to shoot the kill. We go ahead and shoot the kill, right? And so, had this been a white girl, his first instinct would not have been to go for his weapon. His first instinct would have probably been to go for the taser or to go ahead and wrestle and to fight with the young lady Hmm. or to... Uh, restrain her why is it that when it comes to people of color the sad part is you're more than likely to get your life taken away from you in a situation like this and so and, and, and to and to show you what I mean by that here, here's some examples of, of, of some white folks uh, acting crazy see we see this white boy take take the police vehicle Police officer on top of the vehicle, and he drive hmm. all with their vehicle. Now, the thing oh, white, this is a white person actually trouble. stabbing a police officer with but a knife. Obviously, I can't trust you not to run anywhere. All right, so come on, come on. I'm gonna put you in handcuffs for now. Okay. God! Hey! Wow. You stop! He's got a knife. Hey! Stop! Stop! Stop it! You see a taser. He got a taser. Stop! Stop right now! I got him a good boy. Stop right now! Stop! Nick! He pushed the gun away. Gets your taser out. The God. gun is put away. He pulls the taser Stop. out. Stop! Stop right now! Put it down! Drop the knife! Don't do the side! Mind you, this is a black cop. Put your hands behind your back! Put it behind your back right now! So. Oh. You know what? Forget it. That's Campbell sucker punching Lincoln Park officer Patrick Cutler. It's something A she doesn't woman. deny. I am sorry. I told him that twice. <laughs> guy's like a ninja, man. Who the fuck do you think you are? You're gonna die! Step back! You don't put that down now! She grabs the cop by her hair. Let go of my hair! Stop hitting her! Let go of my hair! Let go! Let go! Let go! She won't let go, so the cop tells the other officers to get some scissors and cut her hair. Cut my hair. Seriously, cut my hair. Cut my hair. I don't care. What? Jerry, you're gonna this one, this, 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 this. He take Jerry, their baton and beat them up. Jerry. <laughs> hmm. This one take the cake right here. <gasps> this happened in Minnesota. Oh hell no! He drags. The, this is why. This is why I say to a lot of people that I get. Granted, the young lady had a knife, but we have plenty of other instances to where white folks have done even worse than Micaiah Bryant. And have lost their life. I think I did. I lose my brothers. There we go. I got y'all back. Okay, here we go. Okay. This is so. White folks have done way more than that, and are given so much more respect, so many more warnings, and they have not lost their life. It's no way in the world that that young lady was supposed to lose her life. I don't care what kind of knife she had. You mean to tell me that in 22 seconds, granted, I get it. You know, And honestly, y'all, if he does go to trial, which I believe he will, if he does get off, it will be on that, that the split decision. But 
The thing about it is, white people are given so much more respect than us in situations like this. Mm-hmm. White people, they, they have the ability to tell the police what they will and won't do as it relates to their level of compliance. But when it comes to people of color, it's like we're looked at as these most vicious people who are just this big of a threat. Like, I, I James, go ahead. Go ahead, James. Because <laughs> it's... <laughs> I, 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 I hear you, brother. So, I want... I'm curious to find out more evidence that's going to come out on this particular matter. I want to see more information. I'm going to look at it. Oh, I'm going to force us to look at it a different way in this sense. Okay. So, when the police pulls up, he sees women out there scuffling, fighting, and all that, right? Mm-hmm. But excuse my Swahili, there was a grown-ass man out there, too. Yeah. Hmm. And this is where brothers have to be accountable and stand up to protect the nest in the community. Come on. If you see, as a grown man, that their sister's out there fighting, and you see someone swindling a knife, then that means you need to be on top of it before it gets out of hand. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. See, my thing is, it's not enough for folk to stand around and 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 and, and record and not do anything. Mm-hmm. Those same people got to be people of rationale and people of good sense and say, "Look, put that down. We ain't gonna have that out here." But for so long, what we've been able, what we've been doing is, it, it goes back to you know where the real brothers at. If the real brothers are around, please step up. Right. A brother, if I remember the video correctly, he out there kicking one of the sisters. Yeah, he had just kicked. So how you gonna kick a sister? He just kicked somebody. How you gonna kick a sister <laughs> out there? But you also ain't gonna tell the sister with the knife. Look, you know you can't do it. You can't have it both ways. There has to be right. someone in our community when we see things like this pop off. Now watch this. There was a video that I saw not long ago that someone sent me when brothers and sisters went down to Miami for a college weekend or something. Mm -hmm. And the sisters were in the middle of the street fighting. And brothers were standing around taking pictures as if it was no op, it was no duty for us to actually say, hey, look, man, what y'all doing? Mm -hmm. See, I go back to one of the things that they used to do back in the day uh, 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 when when folk were younger and coming up. They would say things like, if I didn't beat your tail, if I beat your tail because you did something, your mama and your daddy probably going to beat it again because you, you, you knew you were wrong. Yeah. We need brothers and sisters, especially brothers, because I think we we lead, right? We're mm-hmm. supposed to be the leaders, right? Mm-hmm. If they see us standing up for what's right, then we won't have to worry about, again, the police coming to help us out. Yeah. We don't need look. One of the great things in, back in the day, man, in the South and all that other stuff was this. We knew we were up against the wall when the Ku Klux Klan and the police came around. So what we started doing was we started policing our own community. Yeah. That was one of the things that percolated and bubbled up the Black Panther Party. They were able to police the, our own communities. So we're going to need some real brothers, right, to take their hands out of their pocket and be a real man, right? And be mature and be like, hey, look, man, if we're going to do it like this, we ain't going to have it go down like this because y'all know what's going to happen. And mm. that's when we have to understand that, look, if they call the cops, it's going to be seen totally different. And that's why I go back to what I was saying before. It's going to be important for the brothers and sisters who are thinking about law enforcement to go up in there because I wonder what it would have looked like if a brother and sister would have rolled up on that. Because right. chances are, we probably would have seen that before, familiar with it, because we seen it in the hood with right. Maya and Kiki and Tracy and them all fighting and all that. And when you having that badge and you a brother and you a sister or, or a person of color, you can be like, hey, look, I can relate to this, but we ain't going to do it this way. I think mm. that's what we need to do. We need, so my different angle in looking at it is, we have to look at it as, why was a brother there kicking a sister in the middle of all of this and not even saying, hey, look, put the knife down. And, and see, what you're saying, mm. what you're saying, this is what we're talking about, right? While we have to fight the white supremacy part of dealing with the systemic natural instinct to kill a person of color, we also have to deal with 
behind closed doors. When you see stuff like this, you step in and you let your people know. Y'all need to calm down. Y'all need to stop all of this because guess what? If 12 come rolling up in here, they're going to start mm-hmm. shooting. Right? And who's to say? Now, now, you got some people that are saying, okay, well, he shot Micaiah because he was sparing the life of the other young lady. First of all, the young lady was right up <laughs> oh, on Micaiah. And second, who's to say that he really gave two cents about the other young lady in the paint? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Right. I mean, it, yeah. it, we, we, we can hide behind that excuse, but we know what's really going on. You know what I'm saying? And so while, granted, he may have technically, based upon their training, been authorized and had every right to shoot Micaiah or you know, follow what I'm saying, but the reality is, had this been a white person, he would have never pulled the gun out. And that's and, and 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 that's the part that that we have to focus on. If we if we're going to change legislation and change and do something about police reform, it's dealing with that as it relates to how police officers deal with us versus how they deal with white folks. Go ahead, Trey. Yeah, the the, the first thing that comes to my mind is when they see us, right? Yes. And how they see us. They, yes. You know, so 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 when he rolled up on there, he didn't see 16, 14, 15. No. He didn't see teenage girls. No. He saw women. He you know, you know, he he saw women. He saw adults. And I think that is also needs to be going into their reform and their training as police officers of seeing young black African American as you would see a young Caucasian uh, male or female as well. Yeah. Because I think it was was the the, the, the black officer who got cut by the um the white the white teenager. We we clearly see he was like a teenager or he was a yeah, young yeah. adult. No his name, brother. Mm-hmm. It, it, exactly. That same mentality or or or, or that same um caution or that or that same really preference um needs to be taken to an account as they come police our neighborhood that they may not live in mm-hmm. uh, interact with people that they may on the daily not interact with that that same type of uh, mentality needs to be taken uh, with our young brothers and sisters as well because of course um there has been so many instances uh, i'm thinking about dante Wright. he was 20 yeah. years old to me, he, he looked younger than that because, you know, he didn't have any facial hair, really. Yeah. You know, he, he was still kind of skinny, frail. Uh, not, not you know, not to really talk about him. But the fact is, I'm sure that, that those women police officers seen him as a threat. And that's what made them, you know, or made her even think about, OK, I'm going to get my taser. But in actuality, her instinct made her grab her gun. So I think that that's that's the first thing that comes to my mind when I'm watching these videos and I see it. Um, even in my family chat, you, you know, there was a debate of was the officer in the right um, or was the officer in the wrong. So this this incident has split a lot of us in the black community. But um, it definitely has. without un- undoubtedly, it, 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 it's just still uh, whether, you know, it was for the quote unquote saving of another per- person or sacrificing of another person. It still just bothers me to even have a, a weapon drawn, drawn. Sorry, when we see so many other incidents where the incident has been de-escalated through conversation, de-escalated through other means, or you know, through de-escalated through other interventions. So, and this goes back to what James was saying earlier, to where we have to be on our p's and q's, to where we're having these daily conversations with our people. And saying, be mm-hmm. mindful and thoughtful about not only your company, but be mindful about how you tend to escalate uh, misunderstandings with with your own people. Because, right. and, 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 and you know what, my wife said something to me the other day uh, when we were talking about this. Because she said, I promise you, I guarantee you, the young ladies who were uh, beefing with, with Micaiah... I bet you they're kicking mm-hmm. themselves in the head right now because they were probably fighting over something so stupid. And now they're looking back and saying this particular beef caused her to lose her life. Serious. Right? And so and so and, and these are the conversations that we have to have amongst ourselves and with our children to say, hey, everything first of all, everything ain't worth it. First of all. Second of all, 
if you if you gotta find yourself to where you know what I'm saying like you gotta fight somebody because because the reality is today they don't fight like they used to fight back in the day like you, they used to fight with fists fight in the street wasn't nobody calling no police because it wasn't even going that far or that dangerous you was going to pull your fists out fight whoever won was going to win and we go home at the end of the day you follow what I'm saying and half the time you end up being friends with the very people you fighting Right, but but these days, like the, mm-hmm. the mentality of our mm-hmm. young people is so different to where, like what James is saying, we have to catch that, we have to address that, and we have to make sure while we're addressing it, we're telling our babies, hey, be mindful of certain stuff, be mindful that hey, you know, even though you might be beefing with X, Y, and Z or whoever, understand that if law enforcement roll up on y'all, somebody may lose their life. Because they're not looking at you as 15, 16, 14, 13. They're looking at you as an African-American person who is a threat to them automatically because they're systemically and institutionally trained to do that and to think that way. They're not trained to de-escalate your situations when they come in your neighborhoods. They're trained to take you out off of the littlest thing. They're trained to shoot mm-hmm. you as cinemas. Mm-hmm. Over the littlest thing. And watch this. This is another thing. And I'm going to say this. And we're going to wrap it up. Even when you go to the to the, to the the gun range. The image that mm. you're shooting. Mm. It ain't white. It's black. Mm. Catch I, that. I, I want to make a, I, I wanna make a point re- really quickly. Really quickly before we move on. Um, also, we need to really, really get a handle on the media as well. Because yeah. what they're doing is placing out here images, and they keep um, and they, and what they're doing is desensitizing us. And this may even be to the effect of the police officers who are policing and coming to our particular communities. They are desensitizing us and just putting out there really um, black murder on, on, on display. And we're and we're constantly seeing it, and it's desensitizing us to mm-hmm. it. So you know, we, we we I don't I don't think I've ever grown up, and I've ever seen you know any um, Caucasian person, for that matter, or anybody of uh, another ethnic background, um, really be on Front Street on TV of them being killed by the police, whether it's a body cam or not. I know those are new. Whether someone's recording it or not, like. It's, it's just the perpetuation of constantly seeing our black bodies being killed and being slaughtered and being slain on national media. And I, mm-hmm. and I think that that's something that we need to, you know, hold accountable as well. I, I get it. They want to put the news out there. They want to put the story. But there's also an ethical way of doing it. And what they're doing to us as, as African-Americans, man, we're, we're on that every day, man. Yeah. Yeah, and, and you know, when I look at this situation, James, I look at it because I was even watching The Breakfast Club early this morning, <laughs> and even Charlemagne and Envy was on two different ends of the spectrum on <laughs> Micaiah Bryant's uh, killing, and I said that normally they ain't they, they ain't at odds about a lot of stuff, but they was even, like, the, if you didn't know anything about The Breakfast Club, The Breakfast Club is like the show in the African American community, and to see the two of them going back and forth at it, one person on one side and the other person on the other side on this particular issue, man, it, it just lets it, 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 it further pushed your point to where we need to be having these conversations. And it further pushed not just having these conversations, but to the point to where we holding everybody accountable, like like what Trey just said, as it relates to how y'all dealing with, you know what I'm saying, announcing certain stuff and, and things that go on in our community. Mm-hmm. James, I don't know if you got something you want to add to that part, but it it, it just it, it really made me think. Look, man, I got I, I got you. Yeah, man. Look, I got uh, I'm a I'm a you know in Go Go. There's a if you a DC Go Go head, you understand this this phrase. I'm really not much of a talker, but I finally got something to say. Right. right. <laughs> and, and, and and this is what this is what I have to say. <laughs> this is what I got to say. It's four things that we're going to have to either be a part of or address. One is for the brothers and sisters that have the money and the financial wit to do something, put your money behind an organization or cause to help with this movement and reform that we in. Mm -hmm. Right. Number two, brothers and sisters, 
even I call out the Native American brothers and sisters, the Asian and the and the and the white brothers and sisters, uh, especially the African American brothers and sisters. Be a part of the police force to get into those justice arenas, man. Be the police chiefs. Mm-hmm. Be the, the the commanders of these particular districts, so you can come from a totally different perspective, speaking about and bringing about what your diversity means when you come up on something like that. You never know; that could lead to possibly a big training uh, piece that they could probably implement in that in that police force. Yeah. Or number three, now this is mm-hmm. more radical, but it's real. We're gonna have to either be on the police force. Or we're gonna have to get our own police force to patrol mm. us since we Oof. don't want to force or be in contact with some of these people coming to knock us up on our heads, right? Now, if we do that, mm-hmm. what they say it they what they call it in, in the white community, they call it the militia. Okay. <laughs> That's how they're able to get away with the guns and stuff. They call it the militia. So black folk may have to start looking at putting the militia in the neighborhoods in the hood, in the streets where we see a lot of this crime mm-hmm. to try to diminish this so we won't have to worry about folk coming from another culture coming to try to put in place what they believe or what they perceive that's different from what we understand it to be. And with look, that, I'm a, I'm going to be quiet. Look, I don't know if we can call it the militia, though, because 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 to them, <laughs> black folk in the word militia, look, they, they, they get up in arms about that. We might need to re, re, revitalize what our neighborhood watch look like in our neighborhood, because if we try to use militia, <laughs> listen, and, 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 here's, and here's the thing, though. Here's, here's the thing, though. No, for real. Listen, here's the thing, because if we start toting guns the way, you follow what I'm saying, white folks mm. do. We we don't we don't have the ability to, to walk down the street and do what Kyle Rittenhouse did. Kyle Rittenhouse was seventeen; she was sixteen. Mm-hmm. Kyle Rittenhouse crossed mm-hmm. the state with two shotguns, killed two folk, and then literally walked with the same shotgun, still smoking, in front of police. They told him, offered him water, and thanked him for being there. He had a weapon that was even more deadly than the knife that Micaiah Bryant had. So you mean to tell me two teenagers, one a little older, who you could actually charge as an adult, which I think they actually did, right? But the 16-year-old that was literally Mm -hmm. fighting for her life loses her life. But the person that was 17 that took two lives, you ain't... You just let him walk scot. We don't have the, the luxury as as black folks, even though we got the Second Amendment. We can't tote our guns the way white folk can. And that, and that's the sad thing about it, though. That's the sad thing about it, right? But at the end of the day, we do need to have some conversations about, you know, reform and, and, and galvanize and organize and put together some kind of organizations to where if we are going to protect and police our own communities, you follow what I'm saying, to be the first step before we get the law enforcement involved or what have you, then hey, then we need to be having those conversations and galvanizing to figure out how we can do that. You know, and to your point, James, before we before we close it off, you know, you were talking about um, the very thing, uh, policing our own communities. And like I said, James, you know what I do for a living. I deal with youth in the system, right? And so before I moved, I oh, was yeah. living in the very neighborhood that I was servicing. And one thing that actually blessed me one day was my wife and I, we were going to the mall. We were in Pentagon City and one of the youth from my caseload, I ran into him and his mother and his mother pulled us to the side and she addressed my wife and she said, thank you so much for allowing him to do what he does for a living because he really, really helped my son. He really, really got him on the right track. Mm. I saw some positive things. I saw a change in him by the time he got off of Mr. Carroll's caseload. And for me, that that made my heart smile because it was like what you said, James, not only was I interacting with this individual or this young man, but I lived in the same neighborhood. So it was not odd for me to go to the to the store and my kids roll up on me before I even see them say, hey, Mr. Curl, you know what I'm saying? Or, 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 or I'm somewhere and they see me before I see them. And so that lets me know that the impact that I'm having on their lives is the very thing that you're talking about. Like we have to be in a place to where, unlike a lot of law enforcement, we're we, we're building relationships. We're we're building these relationships 
with the people with our people to where they respect us and we respect them. On that note, brother Trey, brother James, thank y'all so much, man. I love y'all. Listen, this this is just another episode with y'all. Y'all are like y'all y'all my brotherhood panel, man. I promise you, y'all gonna be back because it's gonna be a lot of stuff that we gotta <laughs> talk about and a lot of stuff that we gotta address. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And and listen, I'm just I'm just happy so that. Good. Listen, I'm happy that y'all Gotta chop it up. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know what? And and shout out to your brother um Trey uh Rudy because I was talking to him the same time I was talking to you and I was trying to get him on but happy birthday to your brother Rudy. He just okay. had a birthday. He just hit the 30 club. I'm pushing there in October. Right? And so he was yeah. telling me he was on vacation. Yeah, I think yeah, he said yeah. he was coming back. Um <laughs> uh, so but I but like I told y'all last time, I was trying to get you and Rudy on here at the same time cuz that was going to be something else. Uh, but but shout out to him because listen I'm I'm gonna keep pushing. Rudy has been on the show, y'all. He was on the show Martin Luther King Day, and that's brother Trey's brother. They look just alike. <laughs> they look smack alike. Uh, but but nonetheless, I'm glad to have. <laughs> listen, I'm glad to have one of the Daniel brothers in the building on the line, actually talking with us. You know what I'm saying? And so listen, I appreciate y'all. I love y'all. I know we're socially distancing, but look, I'm gonna show y'all this. Listen, even yeah, Trey, yeah, yeah. when you when you come back from Georgia, listen, when we come when you come okay. back from Georgia and COVID die down, I don't redid my office. I don't I don't know if y'all saw the video, but I put the video on Instagram. I redid my <laughs> office and made it guest friendly. And so look, if you look, if if the camera pan over here, I got a spare microphone over here. I got some chairs over here. So when COVID die down and it's over with, we doing in house guests. To where this this gonna be the spot to be. This gonna be the place to be when we doing interviews, so my people can come in and really chop it up in house. You know what I'm saying? When COVID is over with, but let's, nonetheless, let's I thank it. y'all. Yeah, thank y'all. I'll be there. Let's yeah, do yeah, it. James, you you in the area, James? You know you always it. welcome my house when COVID come up when though it's over with. And Trey, a, a matter of fact, anybody that's in the oh, area, well, this thanks, gonna be the man. place to be. <laughs> this is gonna be the place to be. Final words, Trey. I'm a, I'm gonna let Trey go first, and then James. Final words before we shut it out. Man, just want to thank you for an awesome opportunity to be with you, like I said, the last time and this time. Um, as we look forward to where we're going as a nation, as a people, um, we just got to be mindful and accountable to one. I'd leave everybody with is that long journey start with first steps. Mm-hmm. So this is an opportunity with this movement, Black Lives Matters, police reform for us to get involved and start with those first steps, man, to build onto it brick by brick, layer by layer, and make something happen. There you have it, Trey Daniels and Brother James Brooks. They got Listen, y'all stay on the line. I'm going to close the show out. Uh, you know how I do. I'm going to close the show out, then I'm going to get back at y'all. Uh, so there you have it, folks. Thank you, Brother uh, Trey Daniel and James Brooks for coming and talking to me today and talking with us and chopping it up. Listen, I know we had, if, if you're looking at the live feed, um, you know, I, I guess it was it was buffering and all this other kind of stuff. And we had some, some Wi-Fi issues or what have you. But I'm putting this on my YouTube page. It's going to be clear. Y'all can go back and look at the link. And I'm going to repost the link back on Facebook so y'all can look at it without the interruptions and the buffering and all that other kind of stuff. But listen, y'all. Um, we got some some awesome shows coming up, uh, coming up soon. Upcoming shows that we got. Uh, so next week I have the young lady I had on last week, Reverend Jessica Mitchum. Uh, Mitchum, she's coming back next week on April the thirtieth to talk about Jesus and therapy. Some folk believe they they need their Jesus and that's it, but sometimes we need Jesus and a little bit of therapy, right? So she was on last week. She's coming back. Uh, to talk about Jesus and therapy. Also, uh, this this Sunday, I'm going to be on the radio, Spirit uh, 1340, 1340 AM. Um, on, it's a, a, a DMV station, and I, I believe in Virginia. I'm going to be talking with uh, Reverend Sue on her show, Sunday evenings with Reverend Sue, and we're going to be talking about a message to the black man. Uh, and so I'm going to be on there April 25th, um, at 6 p.m. to 6.30 p.m. Or if you're like Trey, you in Georgia or you're somewhere else, 6 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, whatever your time zone is, I'm going to be on the radio. You can also go to myspiritdc.com at that particular time if you're not here in the local area to hear that broadcast. 
Um, it's a, a beautiful broadcast. This is my second time on her show. The last time I was on her show was right after the right after the January sixth insurrection. So this time we're talking about the the Derek Chauvin verdict and some other things as it relates to the black man. Uh, Y'all, please, 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 please. Tune into that one. I'm going to make sure I put it on my social media again. Listen, I love y'all. Y'all be good. Until next week, y'all do me a favor and keep that volume turned up. Peace. I love y'all. And do me a favor. If you see a black person, tell them you love them and inspire them and, and, and encourage them. And no matter what, listen, we throwing uh, bricks through the windows of white supremacy on this show, okay? So what I mean by that is this. Whatever you got to say, don't be scared. Do me a favor and say it with your chest. Holler, and I love y'all. Be blessed.